tracks team i will okay uh b tracks team i will have slack open just in case but all right shall we i guess we'll just kick it off like people show up when they show up uh all right cool welcome everybody um my name is john hanter brandenhorst as you can see on this slide um to run operations, do some sales marketing at B-Tracks. Been with the company for about eight plus years now. Um, and yeah, I'm excited to kind of do the introduction, do the icebreaker before we have a, a couple other uh, really fascinating and interesting speakers. All right. So as you can see, today we'll have Kazumori from Wix and then we'll have Suzuka and Reagan, our resident Gen Zers, uh, telling you a little bit about their habits and whatnot. All right, well, that's not what I want to do. Uh, in case you're going to be sharing on social, LinkedIn, whatnot, uh, first of all, please tag B-Tracks so we can engage with you. But uh, these are the hashtags we are using tonight. Uh, we decided to pick the longest ones we could find. Uh, so <laughs> thank you everybody for joining. Um, many of you may know about B-Tracks, but I would be remiss to not a, at least do a quick company introduction. Um, I will not take too much of your time because there's plenty of people, whether we're talking about online or in person, uh, who are at Beatrice and can tell you more about us. Um, we've worked with a few different companies. Uh, pretty exciting. Um, I was getting a little bit of uh, pushback on the X of the laptop because we technically worked with them when they were uh, at Twitter. But... Uh, Hello, am I getting a feedback? Can somebody please mute? Or JC, can you mute them? All right, I think that's better. Awesome, thank you. Um, who we are? So that basically gave you time to read. Uh, we're a design and marketing agency based in San Francisco and Tokyo. Um, and we kind of focus on market entry and growth. And our mission is to design the future by bridging the gaps between cultures, business, and mindset. All right, and we are hiring. So if you're interested in what uh, kind of roles, go to the B-Tracks website, please. Um, I'm gonna skip past this because this tells you things that we do, but really when we boil it down, it comes down to four kind of key areas, research and validation, UX and brand localization, growth marketing, e-commerce setup and support. So if you're looking to sell something, uh, D to, uh, direct to consumer DTC, we can help you with that. Um, this is how we break it all down. I'm going to give you four seconds to read through everything. Um, and all right, got it. Take a screenshot. We're good. And oh, wait, there's more. Uh, all right, now let's just jump right into it. This is going to be the fun part. Uh, if you have your phone, and um, JC, if you don't mind telling me when people are ready online too, because I can't see online, um, you can either point at the QR code or join via putting in slido.com and then putting in that number. So I will give you all uh, some time. Do, 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 do. Thanks, Peter. I appreciate you turning the music down. I kind of forgot about it. Yeah, no, I hear you. All right. I think, are we ready? Is everybody, I'm going to look around here and I'm going to base it off the in-person group. All right, cool. Here we go. In 2009, UNESCO published an atlas of endangered languages and sounded the alarm about the rapid loss of linguistic diversity. Among the 2,500 endangered languages listed in the atlas, how many were in Japan? Welcome, Jesse. 15, all right. This is fun because um, this will help, uh, help set the stage for who's gonna get the next couple of them right also. Uh, Three, three's uh, winning, so 456, 826. Uh, if, you, if, if, if you don't sense my surprise, uh, 2,000, boom. All right, um, I'll give it another couple of minutes, a no, couple of seconds. All right, the right answer is, and I don't see it on here actually. Oh, two participants are typing. Well, I just gave away for you guys. All right, here we go. The answer is eight. Eight are spoken in Japan. Ainu, Hachijo, Amami, Kunigami, Okinawa, Miyako, Yayama, and Yonaguni. Six of those eight are in Southern Japan. Um, and what's interesting is obviously there's quite a few traditional dialects in Japan that are also considered endangered, but according to the UNESCO report, 
the, they were looking at specific languages. And if you're like, well, those are all Japanese. Well, as you can see on the left, that's Ainu. Arigato is iaidaikere. Uh, if anybody speaks Ainu, please let me know if I just butchered it. Um, but, you know, I, I, I speak a little bit of Okinawan, actually. And Okinawan, instead of arigato, it's nihedeiru. And instead of watashi wa jon desu, wanne jon di choibin. So um, I hope that just proved that they are nothing alike. Um, and yes, uh, endangered. So uh, you guys started off great. We are 0 for 1 across the board. So you're all on the same page. But now you know something. Next one. Uh, so wait, one of these was Hachijo, uh, which is interesting because Hachijo is an island that is technically part of Tokyo. And I think if you were to take a boat, it'd be like an overnight boat. Um, so there's quite a few islands off of Tokyo um, that are connected. Whoa, no snakes, all right. Koalas, all right. Historical connection to convicts. Nobody thinks there's a Bondi beach in uh, Hachido, I guess. Um, I'll give it a few more, a few more. All right, we've got the snakes thing, koalas. Oh, somebody's. <laughs> this is interesting. All right, well. The truth is both are connected to convicts. Um, basically, the first uh, first mention of convicts was in 1606. Uh, Fukita-san uh, was banished. Uh, he basically fought the wrong fought the wrong battle, uh, and he was exiled to the island uh, of Hachijo with his uh, with his sons. Um, and over the next 260 years, about 1,800 people were exiled there for various crimes. Uh, leading to the island's title as the Island of Exiles. If you don't know, Australia also has a history uh, similar. Um, he actually got a full pardon and was offered the opportunity to go back to Japan. He declined. His wife had passed away. His kids had fathered kids on Hachijo. And so there, I, I actually learned a lot when I uh, did this research because I would have not done this either. All right, last one, y'all. What did Joey from Friends do a commercial for in Japan. And, and I, I love this because you probably, if you've been to Japan or you know anything about American celebrities or foreign celebrities, they, um, they will do some really interesting ads in Japan. Um, actually, Arnold Schwarzenegger had like a secrecy clause. So back before the internet was a thing, it would be really hard to find these ads because there wasn't the internet. So they weren't allowed to show some of these ads in, in uh, the US. Um, so, and the main reason they did it, can you guys guess why they would do something like this? Money. Uh, the budgets were a lot higher <laughs> to bring in uh, an American celebrity. All right, so beer is the winner. Uh, lipstick was a close second and Tamagotchi cigarettes, a car. <laughs> All right, here we go. Ready and... Oh, this is this tape. Believe me, you would have some comments. All right, now, remember, I got paid a lot of money for this, and it only aired in Japan. Ichiban. Ichiban, lipstick for men. Ichiban. Lipstick for men. Saiko. And that's how I know you didn't watch the tape. <laughs> he really is a chameleon. So, so thank you, everybody, for joining the, uh, <laughs> the icebreaker. I hope you learned something, whether it was serious or not. Um, next, we have Reagan and Susie. Here's one. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight. Um, I'm going to take over from here and then talk about the Gen Z and localization because, according to John, we are the <laughs> Gen Z, which is true. Um, okay. Hi, so my name is Reg. Oh, is it on? Um, hi, my name is Reagan. I'm the marketing specialist at Beatrax, and uh, I'm from Fernandina Beach, Florida, but I live in Durango, Colorado. And uh, yeah. 
And my name is Susie. I am a UI UX designer at Beatrax. Um, I'm from IT Japan, but moved here uh, when I was in high school. All right. So this is going to be a really short uh, session. It's going to be 15 minutes. Um, so we're going to go through the ones on agenda, uh, what's Gen Z, US versus Japan, marketing tips, and a little bit of true or false pop quiz. Um, I actually had the opportunity to talk in the um, another event that we hosted in Japan last week. So I'm going to try to incorporate some of the insights that I got from the speech. Oh, this is more clear. <laughs> what is Gen Z? So Gen Z refers... I'm just, I don't want to use this. Yeah. Gen Z refers to the individuals born uh, from the mid 1990s to the early 2010s. Uh, we are also the digital natives who are growing up in an era saturated with the digital technology. And we are also the generation that's the most uh, diverse and inclusive. Um, there's also another uh, term called Zillennials. It's really new. Uh, it refers to the, bo uh, the individual individuals born between 1992 to 2000. 2002. So I'm technically zillennial and you are. Yeah, too. same. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so from here, we're going to take a look at the statistical differences uh, in Gen Z between US and Japan. Okay, okay. so um, in terms of social media usage rates among Gen Z, uh, the US and Japan are both pretty up there. So it's one of the, um, it's definitely the most online uh, generation so far. Same, same as uh, Japan. Okay, and so these are the top used social media sites among Gen Z. And um, you might be surprised to see YouTube up there. So that's the number one for US, TikTok, Instagram, and Snapchat. And um, we're going to talk a little bit more about why YouTube is considered a social media platform in a moment. For Japan side, LINE is the, the most popular uh, social media. It's a communication or messaging uh, social media platform that most of the Japanese people use as a primary uh, way to communicate. Um, and we have YouTube and X and Instagram followed. Okay, so YouTube is considered a social media platform now. And um, that's because people are able to create accounts, create content and post content and um, engage with content. And um, it's become more of a platform for community development now than it was originally. And so, um, yeah, I was surprised to see that it's considered a social media platform now, but yeah. Right. Okay, and um, these are the rankings of the social media sites that influence Gen Z shoppers. So um, for the US, it's Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, and Facebook. And um, for, for Japan, Japan, it's Instagram, YouTube, X, and TikTok. Um, X is really, really big um, in Japan compared to the US. Okay, <laughs> okay so um, we're going to talk about three marketing hacks for when you're targeting Gen Z. And you've probably seen a lot of these um, just, just from existing. <laughs> but um, yeah, one of the things that you'll notice um, is a lot of humor. And so we chose the example of the Duolingo owl because um, it's really interesting to see that the, the use of humor is present in both the English and Japanese social media strategies. And um, yeah. Yeah, it's really a good, great example for localization as well, but because you can see the Japanese side. Um, this is the Japanese uh, X account, um, and they use a lot of anime or a lot of different um, content specifically for Japan um, and incorporate that into um, the specific like, localization to uh, Japanese market. <laughs> okay um so another point to pay attention to is um uh leaning into what gen z is passionate about and being cautious not to do it too far too and um yeah so in the u.s gen z is really passionate about social causes and activism um some of you might recognize the ad from the top it was um an issue for being tone deaf and it was very famous in the news <laughs> The bottom one are the examples of uh, J Japanese uh, marketing strategy. Um, the collaboration is really, really, really big in Japan. So these are the um, the exclusive goods uh, collaborating with anime or games or influencers or even YouTubers. They do a lot, a lot of collaboration and use uh, that as like a marketing tool. 
Um, and uh, so as we mentioned before, Gen Z is the most diverse generation in history. And this is true in the US and Japan. And um, we've already seen it in US mainstream media. Um, and just, oops, <laughs> and, oh, it's all good? Okay, sorry. <laughs> so um, yeah, like you'll see a, a lot of the brands that are becoming more popular now are the brands that are embracing inclusivity and offering more variety and sizing and um, yeah. And so, yeah, we're seeing a lot more diversity in marketing towards the US. And this is also becoming true in Japan because even though Japan's traditionally a homogenous country, it's becoming more and more diverse uh, every year. And so we were starting to see more diverse marketing in Japan as well. Um, but uh, we recently, do you wanna talk about our, uh, um, so, <laughs> um, even though it's, it's growing in, in Japan, there's still some things like, uh, showing tattoos in the Japanese media is mm -hmm. still not, um, it's not very common. And so like, but that's still not being shown, but that's yeah. okay. Yeah. Uh, we had a client uh, that we worked last year, actually this year, um, and we are helping them with the social media platforms, posting Insta uh, Instagram posts and stuff. Um, but the client uh, requested us to not include anyone with a tattoo, even if even though the the what is it the pop up shops were still in the US because the company is Japanese, they they wanted to follow the the Japanese um, what is it custom. Mm -hmm. Okay, are you right. gonna? So we're like gonna, a true or false. Yeah. So if you look under your chair, you'll find <laughs> really um, DIY. Yeah, it's a little bit <laughs> DIY, but uh, so um, so I thought it'd be fun and, and interactive for you guys to play with us. So yeah, all right. <laughs> all right. Um, let's get started. <laughs> okay. First question. Gen Z prefers traditional forms of communication, such as face-to-face -face interactions over digital communication. Oh, I'm not sure I'm saying. True Ooh. or false. Okay, we're actually seeing mixed false. responses. If you're joining us online, you can um, put in the chat as well. We'll look later. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of, a lot of false? false. Okay. All right, we're seeing a lot of false in the crowd as well. And the answer is? False. False. Gen Z is often characterized by its fluency in digital communication. Um, but part of it, I think, is also the fact that uh, when we were in university, most of the time it was online as well. So we are so used to just doing remote. <laughs> question two. Yeah, question number two. So true or false, Gen Z as a whole is less concerned about environmental issues compared to previous generations. Okay. False. So what are we seeing online? False. Yes. All right. Uh, true. I mean, I mean <laughs> true that it's false. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, Gen Z, as we mentioned before too, they're very um, passionate about different causes. And one of those is environmentalism. And um, yeah. Question three. Gen Z's engagement with social media is primarily driven by a desire for authenticity and relatab relatability in content. Actually, oh, okay. <laughs> True. All right. True. Um, Gen Z places a high value of uh, authenticity and relatability um, in a content. Skip, skip the details, but <laughs> yeah. Um, so question number four, true or false? Gen Z tends to prioritize job stability and long-term careers over flexibility and entrepreneurial pursuits. False. false. Online is saying false. The crowd is saying false. The answer is false. So yeah, um, <laughs> yeah. So I Gen Z <laughs> definitely um, more interested in that. But yeah, Do you too. Yeah, yeah, me too. I was definitely influenced by that <laughs> in my career search. <laughs> me too. Last question. Gen Z is less likely to trust information found online compared to information obtained through traditional sources. False. I'm seeing a lot of false in person. Oh, true. True. False. Oh, cool. <laughs> false. False. True. 
which is surprising. According to our coworker, who is old, John, <laughs> 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 he thinks that all the Gen Z uh, get the resources from TikTok, which is not true because we actually go through actual, really uh, tr trustworthy websites. So no TikTok for us. <laughs> But the fact is, the delineal thing that I just mentioned, I got that information from TikTok. But it's uh, been <laughs> on the news. It was on the news. <laughs> <laughs> but wait, are you sure every Gen Z individual fits the mold? So let's say you're trying to open or start the clothing business, and you saw the article that's saying like, oh, the Gen Z is so environmentally aware. Um, you try to use the sustainability as your selling point, but is it going to work? I'm not sure because um, not all the Gen Z are environmentally aware. Personally, I'm not super environmentally aware as well. Um, so you, what you really have to do is the primary for uh, primary research to really get to know the target that you're um, that you're trying to target. All right, and that's it for our presentation. <laughs> Thanks for listening. Thank you for listening and. So we're going to have five minute Q&A session. Do you have anything? I'll, I'll, I'll be checking online. And okay. then if anybody here has questions, like for the Gen Zers. For the Gen Zers. Zillennials. Questions for Zillennials. Uh, do products that seem to sell here for a Gen Z? Are you guys thinking that that works well in Japan and vice versa, or, or are the interests so different that it doesn't? Or maybe repeat the question too for people like me. Can I repeat that? Um, wait. <laughs> uh, so, um, so we were just asked um, if products that appeal to Gen Z in the U.S. also appeal to Gen Z in Japan. Correct. Yes. Okay, and vice versa. Okay. Um, what do you think, Susie? To me, it really depends on what um, industry you're talking about. Uh, for example, the Nike or the Adidas or the global um, services, they tend to use pretty much the same uh, materials for the uh, Japanese um, promotion as well. And it works because the Japanese people take that as a global service or a global brand. But if it's like a super Japanese, uh, Japanese specific brand, then the same strategy might not work. So that's where the localization comes in. Yeah. Yeah. Any, anything to add? Yeah, um, it definitely depends on the interests of the, of the consumer as well. Um, like we mentioned, every Gen Z is not um, the same. And so, um, yeah, I think it just depends to <laughs> what, who, like exactly who you're trying to target, which group, but yeah, uh, yes. What kind of products are being sold or services are being sold through uh platforms like Line, I mean, I know the communication aspect, but what? Uh, okay, so we were just asked um, which which kind of products are um, being marketed online, the, the Japanese uh, messaging service. Um, thank you, thank you for the question. Susie, um, have you used Line in Japan lately? Honestly, I haven't checked it in a while, but I know they have this uh, new feature called Line Ads where uh, they just put a lot of ads on the platform or the user interface. And most of it tends to be cosmetics or the games, uh, something that, um, so the Line Ads uh, has this feature where it like targets the group of people by age or by the location. So sometimes it's like a dating app, it special, uh, specifically targets the people that like live in that location specifically. Um, so I see the dating apps, um, cosmetics, sometimes clothing brands, um, as well as gaming brands, yeah. yeah. I, I was living in Japan previously and um, I remember getting marketed sunscreen. <laughs> so I think it's really anything. It's, yeah, yeah, it's really anything. Of course, uh, any other questions? I have one that it maybe it's a part or I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. um, I'm wondering if the desire for flexibility in Japan, work flexibility, mm -hmm. either looks different than it does here, or is at conflict with the more traditional, you know, like traditional ways in Japan of working for one company, and if you leave, you have to start from the bottom and do. Is that still true, or is that beginning to change? 
Um, hold on, let me repeat the question <laughs> for the um, people online. So we were just asked um, if uh, Gen Z in Japan is also seeking flexibility in the workplace and how, uh, like when they're searching for jobs and how that uh, relates to the traditional version of Japanese workers where um, it's all very, the workplace is very strict. Um, so, hmm, what do you think? <laughs> I, I, I'm I think, thinking like when, when COVID first happened, I was in Japan when COVID started. Yeah. And um, I remember, you know, there was a lot of envy for people that got to work remotely and the people that didn't um, because people didn't want to wear masks. And, um, but unfortunately a lot of jobs were in person even if they were office jobs because I worked an office job and we were always in person and it was very rare for it to be remote. I think there was a, a lot less trust among the, like it, they kind of didn't think we would work because, you know, typically in a Japanese office, you would all be at the desk together. And, you know, there's the tradition of not leaving before your boss. And so it's weird when everyone has already left technically because everyone's <laughs> at home. And so, yeah, it was, it was a little bit weird, but. Yeah, I would agree with that. Um, mm -hmm. Last week I, I was able to hang out with my friends uh, who's also the same age as me. So they just like started the first job. Um, and most of them were still working uh, in person or like required to be in person. Um, but it might be because of their role because uh, he was a sales, he was uh, designers. Um, but most of them are still in person, less flexible compared to the, at least San Francisco um, brands. Yeah. But I think that there's definitely a desire for yeah. remote work. <laughs> yes. And it's kind of like almost a status symbol of it. If you have a remote job, it's like cool and fashionable. <laughs> <laughs> True. Yeah. I wonder how much of that has, also has to do with the size of houses and apartments and whatnot Ooh. from like the remote work concept right like yeah. your whole family living in one house yeah I think more than remote work uh like working in cafes was was like seen as very fashionable, fashionable. and um I when it. I worked in tourism in Japan there was a lot of push to make workation a thing where you would um market I worked in tourism marketing and we would try and push to create more um opportunities for like hotels to offer workation packages and create workspaces in their lobbies and things like that. So, um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Like having the MacBook open at the Starbucks is like the status thing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, any other questions? Do you see any questions online? Okay. I guess five minutes. Good, all right. Cool. Well, oh. um, <laughs> thank you for your questions and thank you for listening. And um, I hope that you learned something new or found it interesting. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Next. Thank you, uh, Reagan and Susie. Um, by the way, is this still working? OK. Hello. Um, next, oh, there's our addresses. For those of you in person, you know one of them. Um, by the way, so one thing I love is we check in on Slack and the Tokyo team always checks in. They're going to Calm. And there's just something about like checking in and saying you're going to Calm that makes me smile because um, that's the name of our building, I guess, in Tokyo. So if you're, if you're in Tokyo, go visit Calm. Kazu, Mr. Kazu Mori. Are you ready? Uh, so this one for sure. OK, cool. And the clicker, right? Yep. And I should be using this microphone? Yeah, I mean, oh. it's for these people. OK. Can you hear me OK? OK, great. So uh, first of all, uh, thank you to Ito-san and Reagan for the great presentation. I think we learned a lot and uh, made us a bit old, <laughs> Fe uh, made us feel a bit old. Anyway, so uh, my name is Kazu Mori. Uh, I'm the Japan Marketing Manager at Wix.com. Uh, thank you so much for joining uh, here in the VTrux office and also in Zoom. Uh, thank you, VTrux, for inviting me. Uh, this will be the last presentation for the night, so feel free to grab a drink during the presentation. Uh, don't mind if I do. Uh, 
And I'm sorry. Okay, and I'm here to uh, talk about localization and marketing. Uh, and since they're really broad topic, I'm going to stick to a theme, uh, which is name. Okay, name can be a product name, brand name, any, any name associated with uh, your business. And uh, anyways, do uh, you guys like movies? Yeah, everyone likes movies. I love horror films, okay? And uh, there's nothing that I hate more in this world than uh, spoilers. No one likes spoilers, right? So a few months back, I was watching this great uh, Swedish horror film, Let the Right One In. And I made sure to avoid any spoilers. I don't want to know anything about the movie, not even the trailer. But uh, I ended up, uh, you know, it ended up uh, kind of getting spoiled anyways, in a very unexpected way. How? So the title, Let the Right One In, is localized in Japan as My Ellie, 200 year old girl. <laughs> so the protagonist is a boy who gets close to Ellie, who is a girl, but also 200 years old. So probably a vampire or something. And that's exactly the plot. Okay. Well, I was sad and I was mad, but they actually do this a lot in Japan, right? Uh, for example, Frozen. <laughs> is uh, Anna and the Snow Queen in Japan. Up is Uncle or Grandpa Carl's flying house. So they do this all the time. Uh, it's normal for companies to uh, have different names in different countries, like Lay's Chips have nine different names uh, around the world. Uh, but you would think that Japanese people are angry over these spoiler titles, right? Because I was, but in fact, Japanese people love spoilers. They love it so much, they want their daily lives spoiled. You don't believe me? Uh, every morning in Japan, uh, news programs have this digest of horoscopes. Uh, it's kind of like a fortune telling thing. So they will be telling you like, hey, you a Virgo, uh, drink some jasmine tea and carry a handkerchief or something like that. And they love it. Uh, and to put this in a more professional way, uh, Japanese consumers have a strong desire to know the outcome in advance so they don't regret their decision. That's the consumer mindset, okay? And companies use these traits to sell products. For example, uh, Nepia moisture tissue was uh, introduced in 96. It didn't sell well, so they rebranded in 2004 to noise celebrity, and they quadruple the sales. Another example, uh, Renown's Fresh Life. It's, it's a socks, it's confusing. Uh, and they uh, rebranded this to uh, commute comfy piece, and they increased the sales by 15, per, uh, 15 times. That's incredible, right? And they're basically doing something similar to the fortune telling. Uh, do you want your nose to feel like celebrity? Whatever that means. Uh, do you want comfortable socks during commute? Then here we go. That's, this, is the, this is the solution. Okay. And you might be thinking, hey, that's speculation and you're going too far. Uh, so I'll give you uh, our own example. Okay. So this year, uh, Wix uh, is a platform for making websites and growing business online. Uh, we uh, reorganized our premium plans. And uh, our job was to localize the plan names. Okay? And uh, we thought, hey, lights plan and the core plan sounds vague. So we decided to change them to personal and small business. Why? Uh, we wanted to give our users spoilers. Okay? By telling them that this plan is for personal use and this per, uh, plan is for small business use. We are guiding them and uh, even before showing them the details, kind of like, uh, you know, what's going to happen. <laughs> and by making these distinctions, uh, it also works as an upsell strategy, uh, meaning business users won't mistakenly choose small business or personal because all the plans are distinctively, you know, separated. 
Okay, and this tactic uh, worked very well. Uh, we were able to increase our collection significantly. Uh, I can't show you the numbers, but it was one of our highlights for 2023. Okay, so am I suggesting you to change your product name? Of course not, because you can't just change your name. <laughs> just because you heard some guy talking about socks and horoscopes. Uh, but you can use this consumer traits in uh, many different ways, okay? For example, uh, in Japan, B2B business uh, often use request documentation CTA rather than using a straightforward contact us link because this request documentation works as uh, like a spoiler. Uh, you kind of know, you'll be, uh, kind of being educated of uh, what you're going to get, what your outcome will be before making a certain level of commitment, like contacting. Also, uh, success stories and case studies are said to be very useful, uh, important in Japan. I think everybody knows this because, yeah, it's also a spoiler. Uh, you, you will know the outcome. Uh, and we have a research about conversion rate and the number of case studies. Uh, you need to have at least 12. Uh, and you need to have, uh, if you have 30, uh, that's uh, like the maximum ben uh, performance. And if you have less than 12, uh, it actually uh, affects negatively. And also, uh, if you have this request documentation link within the case study funnel, you can further increase the conversion rates. So these are actually very uh, useful. And if you happen to have a chance to change your product name, then uh, Brandon Sam has a great article on Btrax blog about successful brand names and service names. Uh, here's a QR code if you want to check it out. In fact, Btrax blog has many insightful articles. And uh, one of my favorites is uh, this one. It's also Brandon Sam's about comparing uh, logos uh, <laughs> well, I'll be adding more uh, yeah, weird stuff, but uh, okay. Uh, in the United States, they use symbols uh, for logos. In Japan, they use company name. Uh, and in China, uh, animals. Interesting, right? So I want to kind of add something to this. Uh, there's something else that, uh, you know, uh, the companies in US, Japan, anywhere has, but only Japanese companies tend to include their brand names. Uh, in this, uh, and I was going to ask if you can guess, but it's actually very hard. If you can guess, it's you might be like a genius. Uh, so it's it's uh, sound logos. I don't if you don't know what it is, uh, I'll just tell you. Okay, Netflix is, doo -doo. McDonald's is, da 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 da, Intel, uh, dun 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 dun, and how are they in Japan? Uh, I'll show you. Meiji. So they always include their brand name and sound logos, which is kind of weird, right? Uh, PlayStation, yes, and they use that in the global marketing too, which is pretty smart, I think. Uh, so according to Google Auto, uh, what do you call it, suggestion, uh, Japanese as a weird, I think so too. I think it's true uh, because Japanese marketing is high context, uh, relies on impression, it's emotion driven compared to the low context marketing in the US. And I think that's why it allows for that kind of funny, uh, name songs. Uh, and also, uh, here's the ad spends uh, by channel in 2022. Uh, spending and digital ads are decreasing. Uh, print is very strong. And also, TV ads are very strong. So maybe that's why the companies are keeping the tradition of the, the sound logos in Japan. Uh, OK, but don't you think it's kind of too much, too much names in logos and songs? Uh, and does it really matter to have your name in? Well, the answer is, I don't know, but I can give you one example of uh, uh, my own experience that 
uh, when the name was actually like a decisive factor. So uh, earlier this year, uh, we were creating uh, a web, web page for our e-commerce solution. And we always start by doing an SEO research. Uh, for example, if you type create website on Google, uh, our pages usually comes up the top or in the second place. But that's not the case for the e-commerce solution. Uh, when you search create an online store, we are kind of further down, right? So we wanted to kind of change that. We wanted to optimize a website for SEO so we can get more traffic. Uh, and as we uh, do more research, uh, we actually learned that that strategy will never work because in Japan, uh, when people try to create an online store, they don't search create an online store on Google. They search the brand name like Shopify or Wix. So uh, the amount of non-branded keyword is so low, uh, optimizing a website for that is not going to work, okay? Uh, so this is just one example, and I don't think this is a trait. I, if, if, you, if there is an SEO expert in this room, I would love to ask you uh, if this is something that uh, happens in another sector, but in this case, that, that was the case, okay? And, uh, and this competitor A uh, was getting the most traffic, most of the traffic. And uh, of course, our competitors know that the branded keyword is the thing that uh, gets the users the most. So how, do they, how does the competitor A get the traffic? Of course, they use the high context ad that uses uh, uh, the brand name in a song. And this is the only competitors uh, that does that, and they were successful. Uh, and I think it's it's everything is intentional. And in my opinion, uh, name matters in marketing. Uh, yes. <laughs> okay. And so to to recap, uh, so this consumer psychology, Japanese people love spoilers can be used uh, to. Uh, for your business, uh, avoid ambiguity, guide them if they need to choose an option, and show them the result in advance. Uh, and name matters in marketing, and if possible, you need to make people sing your brand name, and that means you're, you've succeeded. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, maybe it was too fast. <laughs> Any questions? We have, we have a few minutes for questions. I'm, I'm keeping an eye on my own. It seems like uh, for a U.S. business, telling your customer the outcome of their purchase or the decision sounds like a pretty good idea as well. Uh, do you think that's really a truly Japanese? Unique trait, um, wouldn't it? I, I mean, I, I think I want to set up my customers exactly what the outcome of, of buying my product would be as well. I that would work yes, I understand. So, I guess a good example is web design in Japan. Uh, you need to kind of balance what looks good and what's kind of you know inspires your customers over information and the amount of information and your branding strategy. Uh, I think VTrax has like a <laughs> good uh, blog about this too, but uh, how, why Japanese uh, web design is too busy, why US tends to go for like a more simpler uh, strategy. Uh, and I, I, th I think you're right. Uh, I think telling them what the outcome is could work in the United States, but uh, in my personal experience, I think it works better uh, for Japanese customers. Uh, yeah. Go ahead. Uh, thank you so much. You had a lot of well-established brands in your presentation. So if you have a new brand and you're trying to just get it out into the market in Japan, like how, how do you, you know, everything here seemed to be over 10 years old, 20 
plus years old. Like how, if you have a new customer with a new product, new company, or they're even developing the brand name, like how do you get it out there into the market when it's already so crowded? Like, do you have any examples where you've taken a brand new brand and got it onto the, the tongues and minds of folks? Okay. Uh, so that's that's a great question uh, because I, I've shown you a lot of TV ads and all that stuff. And TV ads in Japan cost so much money. It's pretty much impossible for starting up uh, when you're starting up. Uh, and using a celebrity endorsement is like crazy expensive. We've tried that. And <laughs> yeah, it's, it's very expensive. Uh, so uh, word of mouth uh, is, is very strong in Japan. Uh, just like I showed you, uh, just letting customers uh, talk about your name uh, is, is a great strategy by itself. How do you do it? Uh, I'm not sure. <laughs> it depends. Uh, but I think uh, Ito-san and Reagan's uh, presentation about Gen Z uh, and how they kind of absorb information uh, might help because if you're st starting up a business and maybe it's for like a younger generation, then yeah, I think that could work by uh, specifying the target audience. Uh, but yeah, that's my answer. <laughs> Any other questions? Go ahead. Um, hi, um, I'm Rio. Nice meeting you and thank you for the presentation. Quick question. So I thought it was interesting that uh, Chinese company use a lot of animals and... Sorry, I can't hear oh. you very well. Yeah. So I saw, uh, I was interested to see how Chinese companies use animals in their uh -huh. logos. And what do you think uh, contributes to the difference between Japanese companies putting their business name and uh, yeah, as a comparison, Chinese companies using animals? Okay, so that article was actually written by <laughs> uh, no one other than Brandon San. Uh... <laughs> um, I don't know about the Chinese companies, but for Japanese companies, I, I read a lot of comments uh, on the blog article that um, it looks like uh, most of those companies designed their logos 30, 40, 50 years ago, a long time ago not changing them, like Sony, Panasonic, Hitachi, Fujitsu, whatnot. And back then, people, Japanese people thought those uh, alphabetical characters look really cool. And they look at those characters as like, like a symbols instead of words, because some people do not read Eng English or alphabetical characters. So they stay as that. Um, as for Chinese, I think a lot of, most of those uh, animal, logos are from the tech companies in China. And many of them actually have uh, their names in Chinese characters. But in order to go global, they realize that Chinese cultures are not the universal language in the world. So they try to convert that into something uh, relatable and identifiable. And they could uh, change their names or convert their names into alphabetical characters, but it's so hard to pronounce it because it's Chinese. Alibaba is one exception um, uh, because Jack Ma decided to have that name in San Francisco. The rest, it's really hard to pronounce uh, uh, except for Chinese people. So maybe they decide to go with the uh, animal characters so that people can, it's a visual language, right? Like you can tell what those are, so. That's my hypothesis, but yeah. <laughs> Anybody else? Um, thank you for the great presentation. Um, I'm wondering, listening to your presentation, it feels like Japan kind of markets based on like emotional appeal rather than like a lot of logic. And I heard that Japan is really big on like kawaii culture. So I'm wondering, does that, is that true? Like, do, do you think it's very successful for companies to kind of, when they come into Japan to build that like cute kawaii-ness or like emotional connection? Thank you. <laughs> yes, so uh, for some companies, kawaii will work. It's not like they will work, they will be accepted, I think, is more like a better way to explain it. Uh, in other markets, 
kawaii is not even accepted, I think. It's kind of, you know, some people will hate it or gets rejected, but in Japan, uh, <laughs> they're more tolerant. And uh, I think kawaii is very good for younger gen uh, target audience. Uh, but also, uh, talking about emotion in ads, uh, I even remember this uh, ad like from a very, uh, when I was so young, uh, Karu, hey, is it Aquarius, I think, the, the drink, do you know Aquarius? It's like a sports drink in Japan. And they always uh, use uh, like a high school girls. Uh, they just do go on like a daily lives in school and they just have them drink Aquarius at the end. And, and I, actually that imagery is stuck in my mind. And it, it, it's stuck so much that when I drink Aquarius, it, I, I say like, it tastes like seishun. Seishun is something really hard to explain. Uh, but uh, when you're in high school, you have this era in your life. <laughs> in your life, uh, like uh, when you're in junior high to high school, or whatever, it tastes like that kind of period in your life. Uh, uh, sorry, I, I know it's, I'm kind of, <laughs> I can't really. It's very nostalgic. It, yeah, it's nostalgic. And that's all because of the branding that's in my brain. So it's that's what I mean by emotionally driven. Uh, like it's engraved in my brain, but not because of the benefit of the product. It's because of the imagery of the product. That's what I wanted to say. <laughs> very much like Yakult. Yeah. Right. That is a very strong nostalgic for anybody yeah, yeah, who grew yeah, up yeah. in Japan. Right. Not only just drinking it, but the the woman coming by exactly. to deliver it. Yes. And ordering it. Uh, so um, we do have a question online. If logos vary by country, when expanding into new country markets, one's logo can either stand out positively or negatively. This means that not only the logo, but also local branding becomes crucial in the new market, right? Uh, okay. So uh, in my experience, uh, I wouldn't change the logo per country uh, because of the consistency. Because you can it's really hard to control where your logo will be seen. And if you have two different logos for the same product, it kind of confuses the, the users. Uh, maybe it, will, it might work in some places, but I've never experienced where uh, I need to change the logo. Uh, but we did change our, our name, uh, like a, an app name uh, for Japan. For example, we had an app for restaurants called Dine. Uh, we change this to uh, Eat by Wix. Uh, we have an app that allows our users to create our, their own mobile app called Branded App. We changed it to uh, My App. Uh, so changing the name will work, but probably not like logos. If they there is a case of changing logo, <laughs> localizing, uh, which is our special of uh, QP, you know, QP mayonnaise. Uh, it, it has a little angel on the package and for the countries like, uh, well, for example, Malaysia, they changed the character without the wings because uh, it's a huge Muslim country. Mm -hmm. uh, their consumers do not really appreciate a little character with wings, which is angel. So they took out the wings and uh, QP mayonnaise in Malaysia uh, character doesn't have wings. <laughs> Mm -hmm. That's a slight uh, localization adjustment that they made. Uh, cultural sensitivity. I'll also add that one of the things we tend to do at VTracks when working with companies that have global brand guidelines is we will localize it, but we're not cha we're changing things like font, right? Or typeface. Uh, we're doing you know treatments to help you market the product, but we're not changing the core of it. Uh, we're not changing the colors per se. We may change. We may have conversations on colors because colors have different meanings in different markets. But that's a conversation with HQ typically. Uh, we do have one more question online. How much experience do you have from IT product marketing, like information systems? What is typical in IT or ICT? I don't know if Kazu, if that. So we offer a solution for enterprises, and uh, I don't know if IT system. Uh, I have the, the right idea, but uh, they provide infrastructures. Is that what I? 
information systems yeah like infrastructure i think part of it would be like i i actually don't know who this question came from okay uh, so uh okay but just in general like maybe even enterprise market enterprise like b2b market, yeah. or something like that I, I would think that that would be closer okay so yeah we we do cater to enterprise customers we have partnership with uh ntt town page uh morinaga or uh konami uh, like large corporations and uh, we provide uh, a solution that uh, kind of uh, makes uh, web designing, managing uh, and growing their business uh, more efficient and so they can uh, think fast, create fast and deploy fast and grow fast. Uh, so yeah, we do have experience. So if you want to uh if you're interested in wix enterprise uh please let me know and maybe i can give you more information and in terms of like it marketing or enterprise marketing in general i think we tend to be in some ways less creative there's more of the traditional way of marketing to enterprise right a lot of it's relation based relationship based sales cycles a lot longer and so we're doing things like in person executive roundtables webinars um kind of trade shows, uh, conferences, okay. things like that. Um, and we're definitely not, in my experience at B-Track so far, we definitely don't do much around logo or any kind of like changing of who they are. Um, I think part of it can be sometimes the personas are the similar uh, when you're talking to maybe US first Japanese uh, businessmen in terms of this, who's buying what. So that's something else to consider. Yeah, sorry, I, maybe I got the the wrong idea i may have gotten question. it wrong too because i'm basing it off of what so, i'm so uh, in japan like corporate marketing uh is all about <laughs> lingi and nemawashi mm -hmm. lingi is like uh you need to ha provide them a document and they'll be comparing the documents from competitors and they have like a, this meeting where they kind of discuss everything and their specifications uh so one of the thing is you need to have uh everything downloadable or something that you can provide right away for the corporate customers so they can go into this lingi state ringy stage uh that's one of the first thing that you need to do and also uh you need to have a sales people who they can reach out to you directly not through uh like a <laughs> like a long distance call or you need to have like a local people who can help them uh yeah like hands-on support sales all right. Any other questions? Otherwise, we'll wrap it up. Uh, we'll say thank you to Kazu and uh, the Zoom meeting. We'll, <laughs> we'll be sharing the recording with people. Uh, but otherwise, thank you very much. Thank you so much, everybody. Oh. All right, everybody on Zoom. Thank